Hello, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us for this, which is the first 8.9 hectares panel session, which we're running today alongside the Food, Farming and Countryside Commission. We'll be discussing a new report, Natural Capital, what farmers and policymakers need to know. But just let me say a few words about 8.9 hectares. Indulge me. 8.9 is a multimedia news channel supporting knowledge transfer for people working in land based sectors and linked supply chains from food to fashion. People who actually have the ability to deliver food and fiber production integrated with climate mitigation and adaptation and biodiversity regeneration. And 8.9 is the only news channel designed and curated specifically to assist practical, investable and inclusive change across land-based industries, land policy and land investments. So in other words, in all probability, it's for people like you. Now, our website is the number eight, the word point and the number nine dot com. Or you can just search for 8.9 HA on Google. We have new articles every day, TV news with a guest interview three times a week and webinars like this, and 8.9 is also the new home of the Farmgate podcast. Now, before we go on, I need to plug our next panel session, which is this Friday. It's an alternative food summit, and hopefully the Prime Minister will be tuning in. And the details for that are in the chat, if I can uh, send that now, work out how to do that. Brilliant. So today, we're talking about a fantastic new report, which is Natural Capital, What Farmers and Policymakers Need to Know, which seeks to understand how new and emerging markets in natural capital fit into a changing landscape for farmers. The Natural Capital report was commissioned by the Food, Farming and Countryside Commission. It was written by Professor Fergus Lyon and Dr Amy Burnett from the Middlesex University, and it was supported by the Prince's Countryside Fund. Now, I'm joined, as you can see, by three superb panellists. Professor Fergus Lyon is the author of the report. He's also the director of the Centre for Enterprise, Environment and Development Research at Middlesex University and the deputy director of the Economic and Social Research Council Centre for the Understanding of Sustainable Prosperity. Lucy Bates is the co-lead for the Farming Transition Programme at the Food, Farming and Countryside Commission. And prior to that, Lucy worked in Nature Recovery for Wiltshire Wildlife Trust and led the LEAF technical team. And in a change to the billing, William Hawes has had difficulty joining us. And so his business part partner has super kindly stepped in at the last minute. We're so grateful to Charlie Davis, who is a land manager and natural capital advisor who helped to set up the natural capital department for Savills in Scotland. She's now a partner at Sylvestris Land Management, a land and rural business consultancy specializing in environmental land management. We have an hour, a little under. There will be time for a few questions towards the end. Please use the chat to introduce yourselves, to say hello and to ask questions because I've turned the Q&A off because, frankly, it confuses me uh, a little. So, Fergus, can I come to you first? Let's talk about your report, Natural Capital, what farmers and policymakers need to know. Let's start with the basics. What is natural capital? What did the report set out to achieve? And what were your key findings? Thank you. I I think when we start talking about natural capital, we've got to uh, uh, really address a lot of the jargon that we're facing because it's quite a lot of simple terms and sim simple issues that a lot of farmers are dealing with over uh, centuries. Um, but it's a lot of new language that's coming up. And in our report, we, we do a lot of jargon busting to try and explain these terms. But natural capital itself are the natural assets, the soil, the trees, the hedges uh, that are there on the land. Um, and I think particularly it's interesting now because it's by calling it capital, it becomes more uh, can be seen as an asset, something that can be monetized, something that can then provide an income to farmers uh, in different ways. And at the time of our sort of uh, climate emergencies and uh, biodiversity cha challenges across the land, we need to find any way, you know, so many different ways of actually addressing this. Uh, and so these ways of paying farmers for nature can be really important. And so we can look at, in the report, we look at uh, a number of different of these uh, uh, natural capitals, whether it's carbon uh, payments, whether it's this idea of carbon offsetting, where um, companies will pay for farms uh, to uh, sequester carbon uh, because of the emissions that they have uh, made in their other parts of the business. Or the other area which I'm particularly interested in, and I speak both as a researcher, I also speak as a farmer as well. I, I, I combine an academic work with my 
farming work. But I, I'm particularly interested in the idea of insetting, where farmers are paid that when we sell our food, it's sold as net zero food, that we can actually offset the production costs. So therefore helping those companies down the supply chains uh, with their net zero ambitions uh, and also encouraging farms to produce food in ways that are um, uh, more uh, more sustainable and sequestering carbon uh, while growing the food as well. So I think the insetting is really interesting. We can talk a bit more about that. There are other areas like the biodiversity um, uh, payments for farmers uh, and also payments for water quality, ideas of nutrient neutrality of when developers are building houses, they have to make sure that they are not damaging the water. Uh, the water sources are, are vital for the country as well. So I think that's the that, that's the sort of when we're talking about natural capital. Um, you um, ask about the sort of the key findings that we've had, and one of the key ones is this idea of uncertainty that we don't you know at the moment the market's a bit uncertain people are not will, quite willing to to uh, sign up to it or there's huge interest in it and really it's kind of a worry in that we're acting quite slowly when we really should be working really fast for this transition to a more sustainable uh, future at the moment so we need to address that uncertainty but also that uncertainty comes because in some ways uh, we could say things are going quite fast uh, and we need to create a safe environment for uh, farms uh, to sign up to some of these approaches, particularly for smaller farms, to make sure that they are doing it in a safe way. They're not signing away uh, something, uh, and uh, you know it, it's it's done in the contracts and the law that the, the the relationships that are developed are supportive of farmers, not exploiting them. Um, but natural capital really is we show it's not a silver bullet. Uh, it's really important, but uh, it's yeah, it will be uh, helping farms on their transition, but it's not a replacement for the basic payment scheme and for other subsidies that are, are that are going, particularly in England. Um, it doesn't cover the maintenance of really you know good uh, natural capital that might be there at the moment. A lot of it is you know people being paid for new uh, new um, natural capital that's being created uh, rather than maintaining hedgerows or maintaining. Um, uh, uh, wildflower meadows and things like that. Um, we also found that there's uh, there is a need for regulation, and it's an interesting area where you've got a lot of businesses and farmers almost begging the government for regulation, and the government not wanting to regulate. Um, when actually it's really needed, we've got real risks of the whole market being seen as greenwash, unless it's uh, being seen as a sort of big corporations talking about the environment, but not actually doing what they say they're doing. So we need to make sure that's done really well. And at the moment, um, it, yeah, there's, there's, there's challenges around, around that we can talk about more. Um, and then also we need to find ways that uh, farms can uh, reach out. We can reach out to all farms and especially smaller farms and tenant farms, what can be done for them uh, within, these, uh, within these new markets. And that's where ideas of cooperation and farmer clusters can be really interesting as well. So again, something we can maybe talk about today. Fergus, you've brilliantly queued up an awful lot of the conversations that we're going to be having uh, across the next sort of 45 minutes or so, I suppose. Um, so that's really helpful. Thanks for that introduction. And just to clarify, and so when we're talking about natural capital, we're not just talking about nature, we're talking about monetizable elements of nature. Um, is that correct? Um, I guess it's 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 used within the monetized uh, area, um, but, yeah, you could say it, it's, you know, the assets don't have to be monetized. I mean, it's and that's where the concept of natural capitalism is doesn't sit well with me. <laughs> yeah, when you're looking at a beautiful view or an amazing wildlife, you, you can't put a price on some of these things. Um, so from that point of view, it's purely monetizing. It's not there. And so that's where we need to think through you know, different what you know, some things can be monetized and uh, can create income streams for farmers. Other bits are just, you know, vital parts of what makes up the countryside, what makes us, uh, you know, what, what, what is there for the environment. So are more challenging, but they still need to be considered, but not within a market. 
Okay. Now, uh, Charlie, I'm going to come to you, and, uh, and I'm coming to you first because uh, we have this sort of idea of insetting and offsetting brought up, and I wonder if you could just perhaps talk us through the difference between what insetting is, what offsetting is, and you know, from your perspective, whether you think that one is preferable uh, to another in a given supply chain. Thanks, Philo. Yeah, just from kind of nuts and bolts perspective uh, initially the best way probably to think about insetting is um if you as a land manager are creating an emissions reduction within your supply chain within your operations um if you then use that reduction um to to mitigate impacts within that same supply chain then you are insetting if you export that reduction by selling it to someone else maybe a, a completely different um, operation operating in a, in a different sector in a different supply chain then then you are then you are offsetting um, and I think the crucial thing for land managers to be alive to is that we don't yet have clarity on what will be required of their businesses within their supply chain supply chains and um, supermarkets are making quite a lot of noise and rightly so about the fact that really the the food industry and the way that we Get our food and, and, and from top to, to bottom um, has a huge emissions liability associated with it. Um, it and some would say disproportionately so. Um, and something needs to be done about that. How we are going to do something about that isn't yet clear, but um, someone is going to have to do something about it. And it is likely that the supermarkets, for example, are going to, and 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 other markets that we sell goods to are going to um in, impose. Um, limits on access to market by land managers um, uh, contingent on measures that those land managers have taken to reduce their um, avoidable emissions um, and cover their carbon liability. So I think it's important for you to grapple with what your liability might be before you start considering exporting any carbon um, units that you might be able to produce on your land holding. Um, uh, and and not compromise your future position by um, undertaking an export that ties you into a contract potentially for for a significant time, 30, 50, 100 years, um, and then find that you have a liability yourself, which is which is um, closing off certain aspects of the market to you, thereby reducing your resilience as a, as a business. And so I think those are the things that we need to be aware of. So in terms of which is better? I don't know whether that, it, it, that's probably not how I would frame the question. Um, it, it's more about being aware of how those two mechanisms interact with each other and that they need to interact in parallel. Um, and you need a good grasp as a land manager of, of, of where you sit within that kind of nexus. That's really interesting. Thank you. And I like the way that you framed that. And, and in terms of understanding, it, you know, with some examples, I suppose an airline that's paying um, a, a company to plant trees, that's that's clearly an offset. Um, a dairy company that is uh, trying to sequester, uh, do, do uh, regenerative management to make sure that they sequester more carbon, you know, in the soil uh, within the farms that are contracted to them would be insetting. But then there are some of these sort of slightly muddy areas, aren't they? And uh, you'd mentioned retailers there and I wonder who has the responsibility at that point the retailers might say well we're you know we're not producing an awful lot ourselves you know we're we're stocking other brands what, what do you think about that I think that I think this is going to be a responsibility for everyone and everyone is going to be subject to a level of scrutiny and um that scrutiny may come through policy but as we're seeing now but it's also going to come through market appetites um, so in some ways, everyone's going to want to position themselves in the best possible place. So rather than, I suppose, respons responsibility as against legislation, for example, um, I think it will be about people racing to the top of a market in order to retain market share. And that should be everyone's priority. Um, you're right, you know, how that's going to fit within the chain and how much help those people, say a retailer who is going to benefit from retaining market share, because they have um, been able to uh, make environmental claims and um, to what extent they have to put their money where their mouth is in terms of support 
for those who they're relying upon to deliver those outcomes or those reductions in emissions, those environmental outcomes um, is yet to be seen. And, but there are precedents emerging, which I think are really fascinating. Um, and quite a few of the supermarkets are setting some precedents, particularly, um, I think, in, in at the moment, a kind of pilot scale rather than across um, everything. And, and obviously, it's easier with some products than other products. Um, but uh, what I'm seeing is, is an appetite, a, a, an acknowledgement of the importance of this and an appetite to put their money where their mouth is and really support um, land managers in, in meeting the targets that they set. Um, and that is financially, but also in, in terms of skills, because as we know, and Fergus alluded to, the, one of the big barriers here is, is the knowledge gap and the skills gap. You know, people have been very, very good at farming, very, very good at managing rural businesses in a certain way. And, and, and there's a level of disruption that's come down the line here. Um, and I think what some of those retailers, that, that end of the supply chain can really offer is access to professional advisors and access to training that is going to upskill and make this process, this transition easier for everyone. I'm going to come to you, Lucy. A key theme in the report is power. And many farmers are used to having relatively limited power in food supply chains, and I think they're concerned that natural capital markets are going to be similarly top down. Do you think there's a genuine risk there? And if there is, what can be done to ensure that that power is shared more equally between these emerging natural capital markets? Hi there, Finlow. Um, so I think, I hope Fergus will agree with me that what really comes out of the report isn't so much an evaluation of that risk, but really highlight the reality that it, it is a perception, it's a perceived risk among farmers and landholders. Um, and that perception is currently a barrier. That is worth working as a barrier to a natural capital market engagement um, by farmers and landholders. Um, as touched on in the report, and as, as Fergus mentioned just now, one approach to, to mitigate that sort of, um, is through forming cooperatives, collectives, mutuals, extensions of the farm cluster model, um, real stronghold in Wiltshire, as, as we know, I think I recognised a few Wiltshire names in the attendee list, so hi guys. Um, and that's two examples of that uh, drawn out, one by the Environmental Farmers Group, um, which is a case study in the report, um, and the Green Farm Collective is another example of this. Um, being put forward by the farmers themselves and the Green Farm Collective presented to our January Symposium on financing for just transition. Um, I think the cost and value of robust data, this whole story about baseline and monitoring data, the cost of that, but also the value who holds that, there's a fair focus um, of power in that conversation. And this is a theme that recurs in conversations, I think, about financing and power. And there is an intention here. There's, there's an inevitable tension, but really, between investment for, for private rewards, you know, for, for farm businesses paying out to have that baselining and monitoring under their own management and control and coming with risks. And then the using of public money to put, facilitate public goods delivery through financing that, that, that process. And um, so that's a part of the conversation, certainly. Um, natural England, the biodiversity metric. So some of those metrics that have come out quite firmly. And um, biodiversity metric is an example, almost the opposite of some of the carbon conversations, where there's a casting around between different standards and, and different metrics. There, there is quite a clear metric being published. And, and, and with the intention of quite a clear regulatory framework involving local planning authorities and so on um, around biodiversity net gain and that potential income stream for farmers. Um, and I think multiple car the, the fact that multiple carbon codes are under development um, through, for instance, on the natural, um, natural environment investment readiness and funded projects. Um, are positive in terms of that structure emerging, but that giving the potential for a, for a fair payment structure in both the buyer and the seller scenario. Um, but I think good governance of these schemes is really going to be paramount. That's that's the question. How are we going to use these metrics to empower farmers and not to encourage a race to the bottom on price or indeed quality of those uh, public goods or environmental credits that are delivered? I think another important aspect for smaller farms, I think this does come through in the report as well, 
is um, how aggregation platforms will be important, you know, in order to enable and broker market access for the smaller farms or even smaller projects within larger farms. Um, and these also have the potential or also offer to absorb some or all of that risk exposure that businesses may be unable to bear, especially the smaller business. From project failure, you know, inevitably some projects won't deliver the anticipated credits that the actions paid for have, have projected. Um, but I think a real lesson to be learned, coming back to the food commodity sector that we're cautious not to replicate in every way, um, is that these brokerage platforms aren't duly extractive. So really having an eye on that as market developments. And finally, as Fergus said, tenancy, tenure, you know, really to enable this to be an option across the board for farmers. But Baroness Rock did um, explicitly draw this out in her review last year um, about the importance of legislative reform to really bring some of the um, tenure legislation into line with these market opportunities. You, thanks, thanks so much. You, you mentioned biodiversity net gain, and, and I think probably that's a, a subject for a whole webinar in itself. But one of the things I wonder about with that is where uh, a development, for example, is going into something, you know, which has very genuinely valuable habitat, ancient woodland or something, which is being taken down to make way for uh, the development. How how can that be measured and, and how can that then be sort of offset and recreated? Um, so there's this sort of net gain elsewhere. How does that work? So I think what you're describing there is an irreplaceable habitat, which is a whole category within the metric, which falls outside of a biodiversity net gain framework. The, the intention of the biodiversity, my understanding of the biodiversity net gain system and facilitated by metric currently 4.1, is that it's looking at comparable habitats, habitats that can potentially be replicated. And there's a, there's a level of condition, there's a level of definition. It's not, I don't think any, I don't think anyone there would claim it's intended to facilitate the destruction of irreplaceable habitats. That remains a bespoke negotiation between a local planning authority and a development. So that kind of slightly out of this. There are issues of, of, of nature. I think no one would argue that there aren't uh, problems with measuring and that the, the metric itself is certainly arguably flawed. I think you struggle to find a metric that wasn't. And um, as you say, there's a whole webinar there. There's a whole conversation um, there. But yeah, being from my perspective and my experience with the wildlife trust in Wiltshire, that being done well is the best chance of that having a positive outcome. There being an oversight on surveying season, on, on the um, qualifications of those using that metric, that's the best chance of that coming up um, good. Lovely. Thanks, Lucy. Charlie, uh, one of the, I mean, I think it would be helpful just to sort of <laughs> talk about um, different ways of measuring uh, natural capital and the, the level of monetization that's possible in different areas. And so one of the critical aspects of any market is the fungibility of its assets. So how tradable are the natural capital assets in Britain today? Yeah, I think that's a good question. It's an important thing for people to get their head, heads around. Um, and uh, and Fergus alluded to this earlier um, in, in his brief summary. Um, and, and, and the report is very clear that natural capital isn't going to be a, a, a kind of silver bullet for land managers to fund all of their nature positive land management, um, uh, to, to Fergus's earlier point. And I think fungibility is is... It, it is one of the aspects of that, um, really. There's a, there's a lot of noise around nature-based solutions and natural capital, um, and it, and and I think the important thing to realise um, that that often it can be hard to is that at the moment there are only three externally regulated established markets for natural capital. Lots of people are making a lot of noise about lots of other potential things, but it, but making the distinction between what is happening and what could happen. Um, you know, sometimes people like to blur the, the edges of that when they've got something to sell, um, which is understandable, but it's very important that land managers are clear about it. And the, and the three that exist are the voluntary carbon market, biodiversity net gain and nutrient neutrality. Um, and each of those has a different level of fungibility. Um, carbon, theoretically, has universal fungibility in that Carbon sequestered, a ton of carbon that is sequestered anywhere in the world is equivalent to a ton of carbon sequestered anywhere else in the world. So 
um, it can be traded and used as an offset um, against any activity that also, you know, emits a, a, a ton of carbon. Um, it, it, in 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 practical terms, our UK codes only actually function within the UK, but that's 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 a kind of technicality rather than a than a kind of fundamental truth about them. BNG has got a kind of intermediate level of fungibility, if you like. It's it's based on equivalence still. It's based on equivalence of habitat and habitat condition, but it's also graded on the basis of um, proximity to where the activity that it is trying to rectify um, was undertaken. So the value of BNG units um, decrease the further you get away from that um, that action um, that you're trying to rectify through the BNG unit. So it's got a kind of intermediate level of fungibility, um, which is 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 very suitable <laughs> um, for for what it's trying to achieve. Um, it, it's making sure that we don't sort of um, concentrate all of our environmental action in, in pockets um, and leave other areas denuded. It, it, it's quite good at sort of levelling the playing field. Um, nutrient neutrality isn't fungible at all. It's based on a specific location that has been identified to carry out um, because, because certain actions are being carried out in those areas. Um, so it can't be moved around. Um, it, it, it exists within a very particular location. Um, and what this means is that there are actually limits to um, the markets with actual buyers. So the markets that we've set out here and that are externally regulated are um, are the only ones that buyers have co confidence in effectively. And that's because, and, and an appetite to buy, because of policy and legislation. They're driven by policy and, and legislation rather than pure market appetite. And a lot of the other things that people are talking about are things that are being led more so by sort of pure market appetite and and a kind of um, manipulation of philanthropy, effectively. Um, so, so that's an important thing to, to understand as a limit on what land managers can engage in, in terms of natural capital. And the other key limit is, is land capability. Um, natural, you know, not all interventions are suitable or fit into all land types. And if you can't do the things that fit into this, um, this quite limited framework of markets at this point in time, then, um, you aren't going to be able to participate in them. So these these are limits on the activity, and what what I think it's important to highlight because there's quite a lot of um, there's probably quite a lot of concern um, about what this is what impact this is going to have is to say that this isn't going to suddenly change what the landscape looks like overnight because of these limits because of these parameters. Um, what it is going to do is provide another route to incentivize the kind of change that we'd like to see. Um, on land that is in a position to do so, in a position to deliver uh, material environmental outcomes and ecological outcomes on their land. Um, and those land holdings are going to be able to contribute to mitigating the twin crisis of, of, of climate and, and biodiversity loss. Brilliant. Um, Charlie, you mentioned carbon there, and of course, uh, the nutrient management, uh, things like nitrogen and water health. You know, there are some things that are easier to monetize, easier, you know, more fungible than others. And Fergus, I wonder how we deal with the fact that some natural capital assets are just naturally more easily monetized in a private marketplace than others. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a real challenge that there could be an overemphasis as uh, oversimplifying the system. And you see examples of, of that with uh, yeah, a, a complete emphasis on, on one element of natural capital can destroy another type. So an emphasis on carbon capture through monocrop sort of forestry can have you know, negative uh, biodiversity benefits. So it's about bringing that together. But the challenge then is what happens to those elements that are that, that you can't monetize and how do we bring that in so that's where yeah that is part of a political discussion and the importance of uh protecting some areas of the uh of environment that can't be monetized um that yeah th these markets are not there to replace those political decisions so i think we always need that and we always need the uh the ongoing debate uh, around it and i think yeah, you you do find that um you within um yeah, within within the things like the biodiversity net gain, there's there's an emphasis on particular uh, types of habitats that can be created, 
and while others are harder to create. So there's going to be a bias that way. But I think you you know you also find bias in in the whole area of biodiversity towards particular species, for example, with sort of various slightly more sort of charismatic uh, species taking more attention than than others when uh, you know which where there, there can be sort of funding going into some areas that are seen as more appealing than others but i think that's where it needs the ngos working with the policy makers working with farmers to uh you know to work together to protect what can't be monetized there's a question here for or there's a hand up from henry henry if you're able just to um pop a question into the chat or email it over if uh, if that's possible that would be great and we'll come to questions uh, a bit later on so this is a question for for all of the panelists i uh, don't know who wants to take it maybe charlie to start with um i want to ask about additionality because it's something that we always talk about in terms of uh, of natural capital uh, and so this is one of the key principles in these forms of market. And the question is whether it's always the most appropriate metric, because surely, as Fergus alluded to earlier on, we do need to be able to value the maintenance of high quality assets that farmers and land managers have been working to uh, ensure a, a functioning, you know, brilliantly in, in nature terms over the last 30, 40, 100 years, as well as the improvements of assets that have been degraded. Yeah, I think this is an this is a good question and, a, and an important thing to, for us to, to discuss because this question comes up a lot. And it, from my perspective, additionality will always be sacrosanct within private markets for ecosystem services, and I and I think that's quite right. Um, it's a way to ensure that interventions that are being paid for weren't going to be undertaken anyway under a business as usual scenario, and it, it's that difference, that counterfactual that creates a tradable asset. Um, what I envisage, and call me an optimist, <laughs> um, but what I envisage is that support that you're talking about for maintaining pre-existing good conditioned habitats by land managers will be achieved through different means. That this is one of the tools in the toolbox. And natural capital, private markets for natural capital aren't going to solve everything. They're not going to solve all of our conservation biodiversity, climate issues, but they are an important tool that we need to respect. And they only remain a tool that we need to respect and is useful if we make sure that they retain incredibly high integrity. And, um, and, I, and I think it's probably a good point moment to say, having engaged with the codes as they stand a lot, I am increasingly and very confident of their integrity so um you know I, I i question those who who haven't gone through the process of registering schemes you know saying oh you know it's bandit country etc it's it's pretty rigorous so and i'm happy with that and i want it to stay pretty rigorous um, and they do ask challenging questions about whether or not you're achieving other outcomes um side by side to the core core outcomes of those codes so um it, that's really really important and what I think will happen is sitting beside that will be things like environmental philanthropy and public subsidy um, that will have a role then in, in the maintenance of habitats. Um, and, and also the conservation sector that's been rolling on for, for a very long time and doing brilliant work will continue to do that. Um, but to be clear, I think an important thing for, for land managers to take away and farmers to take away is, is that, that anyone undertaking a deal over ecosystem services should be making sure to price any ecosystem services that they sell based on the costs of the maintenance of those habitats for at least the contracted period that they're, they're entering into deal. And we know that those um, are often quite long term. Um, but often people get excited about the upfront figure that you might get out of, a, a say, a carbon transaction. But what you need to understand is that is spread over maybe 30, 50, 100 years. Um, and you need to cost in the maintenance and the liability that comes with that contract. Um, and, and often, once you do crunch the numbers on that, land managers are at the moment underselling themselves. Um, and so they need to make sure that they are they have the support to make sure that there there are um, deals being done that that reflect that maintenance burden. Um, and I suppose the other thing I want to say is is to be challenging. It, yes, this question comes up a lot, but how big an issue is this really? Because 
certainly where I work in the uplands of Scotland, um, the reality is, is that we're having these conversations because we haven't been doing a good job of looking after habitats. We haven't been incentivized to look after habitats. In your average landscape, there aren't probably a lot of habitats, area of habitats that ecologists would come on and say, yeah, big tick, this is in fantastic condition. I think we need to face up to the fact that we haven't been doing the job that we need to have been doing. And that's why we're driving so hard and so fast to start to create the habitats that we have been losing at such an extraordinary rate over the last recent um, history. And there's a big question about land managers coming out of agri-environment schemes and what they're going to do um, about those habitats without those, those subsidies coming in. Um, and the other challenging thing I want to say about that is in order to not renege or reverse on their management of those habitats, maybe it comes down to an, an appeal to individual responsibility and stewardship of pieces of ground and an individual responsibility to um, understand the value of the habitats as they stand. So a couple of challenging things in there. So sorry about that. But um, I think important, important nonetheless. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Charlie. I'm interested in the idea of you know, there being essentially a separation between uh, the private natural capital market and the, the public, uh, public goods natural capital market, where you have um, private enterprise being able to uh, invest in and fund particular elements, but those elements that are more difficult to monetize, of course, that's where we need government to be stepping in, taxpayers to be helping to make sure that the, the maintenance, perhaps that maintenance element is still funded, but it's funded in, in a slightly different way. Fergus, I wonder if you've got anything to add to uh, what Charlie said there. I think you put it very clearly. I think it is a crucial role for the government you know, the public good is the, is, is the maintenance there. And I think uh, uh, the, uh, um, I, I don't know about Scotland in, in detail on that, but in the English case, it's still an emphasis on additionality uh, and, uh, you know, farms who have gone, put in some natural assets through uh, the sort of stewardship payments in the past, you know, in 10 years on, they then you know, go rather than arable reversion, it, it becomes a sort of low input grassland, for example. Um, and that's a challenge. Yeah, and a real disincentive for new for other farms to take the positive actions for biodiversity that's that's needed. So it, it's, it's really needed to sort of keep the um, keep the market going. It also de-risks the investment in the long term. And, and the point Charlie made about the obligation to future you know, for 30 years down, it's kind of an obligation to future generations to, to leave them not with a liability uh, that's there. And that, that's where sort of commitment to maintaining some of these uh, areas is, is going to be really important. Mm -hmm. And finally, the whole issue of additionality does raise the sort of the question about really bad practice of, you know, there have been examples and we never want to see it. And it's terrible for the farming uh, you know, community to sort of, uh, show that farmers are actually um, got an incentive to degrade uh, land in order to sort of uplift it beyond. And we just never want to have that sort of in incentive that encourages people to, to you know, to, to plow up uh, pastures just so that they can be paid to put them back in again, which uh, uh, you know, should be, you know, shouldn't be allowed um, and it shouldn't be incentivized either. Thanks, Fergus. Um, Lucy, I'm going to come to you with this next question. I'm, I'm just skipping forward very slightly because I'm aware of time. Risk is a key limiting factor with smaller landowners either not willing or perhaps unable to take the financial risks that are necessary. Um, I wonder how this is affecting the market and how that can be tackled. Well, I think we've already touched on a couple of the positive opportunities there through aggregation um, being opportunity for smaller farms and projects to access the market, farmer cooperatives, mutuals, catchment markets. Um, I think risk is of course a limiting factor. It's a limiting factor to any crop that one grows. Um, there's a unique um, scenario about these very long-term land use decisions. Um, and I think these risks are going to be very diverse, again, based on sector, based on tenure, based on what's already being farmed, based on the type of land and the opportunity cost of doing something different from it. Um, so, yeah, I sort of refer back to 
really some of those earlier um, positives. And I think there's also a lot of there's a lot of investigation under the way, underway at the moment. Part of what the public purse is funding, in part precipitated by the, um, you know, uh, catalyst, the BPS reduction. And I think paying good attention to the outcomes of that natural environment and readiness funding um, uh, projects, and um, in fact the Elms tests and trials, landscape recovery as a whole, the, the, the um, two-year development phase that is the land, current landscape recovery offering. You know, these are all aspects of um, examining risk in quite a novel uh, scenario that we're, we're all just learning about. And my hopes are, I'm really glad that Charlie's here from Scotland, because I'm sort of aware that through the Elm co-design process, I probably like Fergus have been more associated with the English, you know, more, more abreast of English developments. Um, but, you know, really hoping that some of the learnings, all of the learnings there are spread across the nations. And likewise, there's a, there's a two way correspondence about how it can be done differently, what, 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 what does work, how it works in different landscapes. Phil, can I, come, can I just do, come in on this? Do, yeah, I think I think you're absolutely right, Lucy. And I'm glad you said that. And, and we, I haven't I haven't well on the fact that I'm based in Scotland but it does it does make for slightly different a slightly different well a slightly different literal landscape but also you know a policy policy and, and market landscape and, and a political landscape as well and, and and a lot of the conversations that are occupying us up here I mean you ask a question about power as you'll know the land reform agenda in Scotland is um very hot and conversations around natural capital often are focused on tangible economic community benefits and also um, access to markets for tenants and crofters. Those are the kind of big hitting subjects around natural capital in Scotland, which I don't know whether translate so much down into an English setting, but it's quite interesting the different different issues that come up in different in different places. And I'm fortunate enough to work really primarily most of my time for some of the largest land holdings in Scotland um, on ecological restoration at, at scale. And those holdings obviously benefit from um, it, 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 scale at an ecological level um, but also their ability to um, engage in the market because of the scale of their offer a lot of off takers are looking for big chunks of carbon um, and uh, and a kind of steady stream um, and we've we've just done a a deal which has been really exciting over 30,000 people in units which represents about 10 percent of the total land holding potential to restore peatland of this particular land holding so we're talking about enormous numbers which i know aren't replicable but i think my point is that what's brilliant about some of these pioneers these big actors being able to be pioneers is that they are doing that they, they are kind of paving the way they are de-risking stuff we're working a huge amount out on the hoof um and it's it's hopefully is going to sort of trickle out and de-risk it for other people. Um, it's helping professional advisors upskill um, and, and they're able to shul shoulder more of that risk. Um, and, and then those lessons are being passed on through, and you've got um, things like irons, we've, you know, we've got ferns, which is a, um, a, a public grant for, for investment readiness at the moment underway in Scotland. <clears throat> and that is going to be a huge amount about aggregation. Um, and everything you guys have got a brilliant tradition of farm clusters south of the border. We have three, I think, in Scotland. Um, but I'm lucky to be involved in forming hopefully the fourth, with a view to that being the basis on which they can engage in a private market for ecosystem services within a within an agricultural landscape, lowland agricultural landscape. Um, and and really the thing there is that they can tell a more interesting story about um connectivity, integrity, collaboration, the fact that they're small farmers, smaller land holdings, it, it, it's a selling point that shouldn't be overlooked. Um, and I think investors are increasingly interested in it. And we've had institutional investors approach us and say, we are looking for smaller scale land holdings working together and community landowners and think, you know, different types of landowners that we want to engage with over some of those bigger landholders because we think that that's an important thing to do so yeah really interesting how this is emerging i think sorry lucy lucy just before oh. you just before you go on and I'll, I'll come back to you um i'm aware the chat isn't working i can't change the settings while we're oh. in a webinar i'm really sorry about that uh, it's a it's a new login a new system so 
working out all the settings is quite tricky. Um, and so if you do have questions, um, please don't be shy. Just email them across to me. And uh, uh, if I receive some by email, uh, I'll deal with them. And otherwise, we'll just carry on having this conversation. I really apologize that people aren't able to use the chat because I know that's extremely frustrating. Um, Lucy. Yeah, just on that risk and de-risking, so I've just highlighted, I think, that some of those farm business values, some of the win-wins around enhancing biodiversity, building soil health, managing water well, the things that really have been motivating early adopters, motivating nature-friendly farmers for, for generations, for decades, um, and I think uh, uh, really highlighting those elements of diversification, that it's 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 that there's business benefits also to undertaking good water management, for instance. And I think maybe a more constructive public money angle, in addition to the maintenance that is paid, you know, some of the some of the representation of early adopters in the, for instance, Elm Co design process that's led to a recognition within some of the asset buy and countryside stewardship actions for maintenance and, and of, all, of, of existing habitats, as well as creation of new ones. Um, is re the recognition of the demonstration of some of those win-wins through knowledge exchange, through peer-to-peer -peer learning, through the facilitation of farm clusters that sort of really share that positive experience that is underway, seeing it as part of the upskilling programme of the industry and putting that in the de-risking category with environmental uplift or environmental maintenance that also delivers on these saleable credits. Fabulous. Um... Right, sorry, I'm just looking uh, at a couple of comments as well. Um, Fergus, I, I wonder if you've got any comments around the aggregation element, because, um, you know, what we've talked about there is the uh, the ability to get finance in uh, to, to, to pay for X at the same time as, you know, using that money to pay for X, Y and Z. Uh, and when we go back to those markets that Charlie was talking about, you know, in the sort of early stages, we've got the voluntary carbon market, which is clearly, you know, that's just that's paying for X. That's, you know, one thing. Nutrient neutrality, if we think of, um, you know, nitrogen offsetting, for example, again, that's that sort of single uh, where the biodiversity net gain is much more about that aggregation. Where do you see the future? Do you see um, do you think it's likely that we're going to see more aggregation of these uh, various different outcomes um, so that there's better multi-outcome land use? Or, or are you worried that we're just going to see this paid for, this paid for in a kind of a land sparing by default? Um, well, in the aggregation, the, the, the idea of, sort of bringing together clusters of farmers and sort of projects together is really valuable, but it really has a there's very, very few examples we could find where it's actually happening. A lot of talk happening, a lot of discussions. But actually, money on the table, yeah, is 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 quite limited. Um, and I think so. It's really exciting the stuff on the clusters work, but I know those you know, involved in clusters are struggling to find the, the sort of the the justification for the huge amount of time that they put into it. The benefits are huge for biodiversity and, and the environment through coordinated you know, through sharing learning and through sharing um, you know plans. So you've got sort of consistent and complementary projects on adjacent land. Uh, but we really need the money up, you know, the, the sort of, it needs the, the projects to come through and that's still still limit, still being li limited. But I think the benefit of um, of the, uh, the aggregation as well from, uh, if we look at it, the, uh, on the biodiversity side and the nutrient side, they are much slightly more place-based as we said earlier. So you can have something that is within a, a you know, within a local authority remit where, you know, development in that area Yes, it makes sense to you know to to improve the the biodiversity in the area where a development is happening rather than somewhere hundreds of miles away and i think that is going to get more crucial and uh, i think with biodiversity net gain there's a real incentive to address things on site you know where the development is happening so it's not you know there's less loss but also then incentives to do things locally and so the amount that farmers would get um or the payments are lower the further you go from the from the development so that then shows a real role for aggregation for the for clusters there it doesn't really help upland areas or areas which are far away from development so there's a need there to show that you know to explore you know, maybe the opportunities are going to be um unequal um, and so something needs to be done to address that 
Fergus, I'm going to ask you one more question and then I'm going to go to a couple of comments. So there's a comment from Henry that's come through. And Henry, I'm going to give you the chance just to talk to that in, in just a moment. Um, and then, uh, John uh, Vice, you've still got your hand up. If you want to say something, then keep it up and I shall, I shall come to you. Um, we've only got 10 minutes left. So th this question, Fergus, before we go to um, people who are, are watching um, remotely, perhaps related to the issue that we've just been talking about is the issue of greenwash. And from a citizen perspective, there's a concern that companies who might well be engaged in destructive or extractive activity elsewhere can buy natural capital credits, for example, carbon credits, and use them to virtue signal to society at large. To what extent do you think that matters? Or is it more important that we just get stuff done? Well, I started by saying we need to get stuff done because of the, 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 the challenge we are. But if it is letting companies off the hook for making you know, the change they knew, need to do, we're not actually getting as much done as we should do. I think the what's really interesting now is the um, Advertising Standards uh, Authority is playing a really crucial role uh, in the whole greenwash. And they're becoming probably the most powerful regulator that we have in the country now. And even DEFRA is deferring to them or sort of relying on them to hold companies to account for what they're saying. And actually they're now saying that some of the offsetting that companies are doing uh, you know, won't be recognized. They can't make claims about being net zero if they are um, not making real efforts to, to reduce their own emissions and they're just trying to pass it on to someone else. So that's where there's a lot happening. And I think, but that's only for those who, you know, advertising and make, making advertising claims i think there's a real there's a real worry that we need to hold them to account and that's where journalists come in uh where uh, ngos come in of, of holding them to account and uh you know your your role as well as a, you know, in the media to hold people to account yeah okay I think impossible to know. Can I just quickly come in, come in on this? And and I think an important point to say is that it's it's our responsibility as well. You know, as as land managers, and what I'm seeing is at the at the beginning when this market was nascent, people were doing deals because it was a good thing to do, and they were getting income for land exchange. What I'm seeing now is an increasing sophistication by sellers. The ball is in their court. There is huge demand for offsets. And I am talking about the carbon market now. There is a huge demand, um, and it's a seller's seller's market to a certain extent. It is down to you as a land manager to decide if you are content and you undertake the due diligence on who you're selling your carbon to, um, in order to not be in bed potentially for a hundred years with an organisation that you are not happy is squeaky clean. That will reflect on you, and and that is why most of the most of the deals that I'm privy to are with um, well-respected institutions, often, who have very rigorous sustainability um, uh, because they're beholden to a, 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 a myriad of stakeholders. It, it's not a good idea to flog it to someone that you haven't done due diligence on, but it, it, we can't blame other people for that. It, it's our due diligence who we get in bed with. Fantastic. Let me let me because because we are very tight on time now. Let me go to Henry because Henry had a a question which I think or a comment which I think is is important. Uh, thanks very much. Um, I was wanting to make a comment because I think a lot of this discussion has created or seems to have created a dichotomy between, on the one hand, uh, natural capital which is tradable in the fungible market, and on the other hand, non monetizable natural capital. And actually, I think there's a middle ground which is ignored in this uh, uh, analysis, because actually, if you look at the real economy, just because you can't buy and sell things in the market doesn't mean that there isn't a market as such. I mean, take consultancy. You, there is a market in consultancy, but there's no tradable place where you could trade PwC consultancy reports or something like that. It is only really commodities where you have secondary markets, which can be identified as things that can be passed between many players. In service markets, you don't tend to have that. We are talking ecosystem services. And by ignoring this area, you really, you, you try to model everything on the basis of carbon, which is really uh, carbon and they mean net biodiversity benefits, which are the only bits that actually are commodifiable and tradable. Whereas things like natural flood management, reduction in pollution to water, 
uh, um, why the benefits that actually people can see and, uh, and pay for in different ways are ignored. And actually, I think at the moment, the most successful models are things like Lens, uh, um, which actually don't bother with finance, don't bother with markets, actually create local collaborations between multiple beneficiaries of different elements of ecosystem services and deliverers. I would add further, then actually, if you do that, they're doing that with contracts, which I think are, are, are not fit for purpose, actually legal instrument in this area. And actually cooperatives are. And if you use cooperatives, which are designed for multi-party agreements and can adapt easily to changing knowledge, uncertainty and so forth, and deal with the power differentials because of the sort of governments and its voice and so on, you can actually solve a lot of these problems and actually get the funds by stacking, so-called, lots of uh, revenue, different sources of revenue, and create long-term premium collaborations, which also deals with that advertising issue, because actually the people who are taking the carbon benefits from this, they can't trade them because they're in credit, they're, they're interlinked with everything else, actually can see what they're getting, where it's happening, how it fits into a bigger picture. And on the other side, the people who are delivering them can do due diligence because they have these close relationships, ongoing relationships with the ways of people. Let me, think, let me give people a chance to just uh, comment on what you've said, Henry. Thanks very much for that. I'm aware that we are, you know, we're tight on time here. So, um, Lucy, I'm going to come to you because uh, I cut you off before just to see if you have any particular uh, comments. Um, and people, I'm going to go on till five past and I have a hard, hard guillotine at five past, if that's OK, uh, with panellists. Um, but Lucy, do you want to have any, have you got any thoughts on what Henry was saying there? And then I've got a question also from Nathan. Yeah, I think it speaks quite strongly, Henry. Thanks for that, Henry. That's really useful input. And it, it, it speaks quite strongly to the experience of an example of landholders with a real investment in that high integrity environmental service delivery um, that does require something more than a tradable unit. And my, my previous job was with the Wildlife Trust, um, and built to Wildlife Trust in particular. And um, the, the, the experience of trying to develop relationships or exploring different avenues <clears throat> which really fitted the due diligence level required in order to avoid um, the reputational risk um, of del either delivering something that didn't actually work for the biodiversity uh, remit that we were very much working towards um, or that had was dirtied by a relationship with something that even if it was perceived as greenwashing that was a strong reputational risk so I think that lens model I, I, I'm sure you're aware one one example of which was conducted in the Vale of Pusey and um, part of Wiltshire. Um, very positive, yeah, very much agree. And I think that um, at, in this emerging market, it's important to keep an eye on all those different models. One of which is tradable units. Um, but as we pick that apart, even to the point of the locality of biodiversity units, that there, there, there are complications to that being quite as simple as it might sound on paper. So, yeah, I think the relationship building for the, for the uh, tangible but less faceless aspects of natural capital and ecosystem service really important. Thank you. I'm going to give um, Charlie and Fergus a chance to respond as well, but I'm also going to throw in this other question so that you can kind of choose and maybe stick some closing comments, um, you know, in, in your responses as well. Um, and, uh, and and Nathan uh, says that the chat was disabled. I, I, it wasn't intentional. I'm really sorry. It's just I didn't enable it somehow and I'll work out how to do that for Friday. Um, and he says, what's, let's end on a practical note, what's the best thing that a farmer or land manager can do now? Um, to start to engage with the natural capital marketplace. Um, so perhaps Charlie or Fergus, who would like to start with that? And, and also comment on what Henry said, if you'd like to. Yeah, I can, I, I can start. I mean, I think um, building on what, what uh, yeah, uh, Lucy was just saying and Henry was alluding to, that this is a, relationships are crucial in this as well. And that's also the best way of working out what's the, the next steps, for, you know, the ways for farms to start through finding out what others are doing and through our farmer clusters around, they're great ways of identifying opportunities, sharing ideas of what works, uh, but also getting the right advice um, from people as well. Um, and I think looking uh, at you know, what, uh, what, what would work in your locality, what would work, work in your area. 
the uh, um, some of them, uh, you know, the, the opportunities are around. There's a lot of hard selling going on on some of the areas of carbon and biodiversity net gain, and I think people should look at them carefully. Um, but then pick the uh, um, you know pick the partner where you feel the relationship is there, that, where they have the integrity and the uh, the the right contract, and you know read the contract carefully to make sure you you are you you know what you're signing up to as well. There's a challenge, isn't there? Because this is a market which is emerging, it's changing. And I wonder whether you think by and large that, you know, farmers should be getting into it now or whether they should still be waiting a little while just to see how, how things sort of change, Charlie. I think we should all be acting now. I think I think my first step is for farmers to look at their land holding and think about how they make their land holding more resilient. Um, and that is in terms of... Um, their operations on the ground, but also their business structure and their emissions liability. I think understanding where you are, where what your status is in terms of the environmental crisis is a very, very important first step. I agree with Fergus, get some really good advice. Um, I would say that, wouldn't I? Um, <laughs> but uh, get, get some good advice from someone that you that you trust is, is, who's got a measured approach. Um, I don't think it's too soon to be thinking about this. I think it's the right time to be thinking about it. I think you're going to probably be compelled to do this or engage with these in some way anyway. You're going to be compelled to change the way that you undertake your business, most likely, um, either by the public markets that you engage with or your su supply chains um, or your conscience. Um, so I th the starting the thought process is a very, very um, important thing um, and and thinking about resilience thinking about resilience of your um, of your industries what do you want what kind of management what kind of management do you want to be undertaking and um, what would you like to see on your land holding and and then think about how you might be able to um, fund it and how it fits in with existing funding streams um, I think that's that's most important to to to, to your point point Henry um, and I, and thank you for for bringing it up I think you're right. We've got a narrow focus. We run over time. You know, it's it, it, you know we, we we have a narrow focus by um, necessity, really, because there are lots and lots of activities happening. You're right to point them out that don't fit within these categories. Um, but we're charged with um, talking about these discrete markets because they probably represent something replicable that people want to get to grips with because they have the potential to be replicable within their own areas. Um, and a lot of the the deals that you're you're talking about, I think, are quite um, location specific and there are some very very good ones very often it's the distilleries interestingly up here who are funding um deals around flood management and water um water management because that's in their business interests and there have been some really interesting case studies um but we're talking about markets that that lots and lots of people have the potential to participate in and i think that's why we were tasked with this this topic area but thank you for bringing up the fact that this is manifesting itself in lots of di different ways and isn't that brilliant isn't that fantastic um uh yeah i i think I, I think act now start thinking about it now it's not as scary as it sounds ignore all the jargon um <laughs> um and try and yeah try and cut the crap and we're, hopefully we've done a bit of that today and certainly in terms of 8.9, you know, we are trying to sort of, you know, provide information that helps people to navigate their way through that. And, you know, if you come one day and there isn't something that directly speaks to you, then come back because there may well be something the day after because it is constantly changing uh, what's on the website there. Look, that's it. That's all we have time for. I'd like to thank our panellists, Professor Fergus Lyon from Middlesex University, Charlie Davis from Sylvestris and Lucy Bates from the Food, Farming and Countryside Commission. Thank you to you. Apologies for the chat, uh, but thank you for watching and for taking part and for those of you that emailed and, and made comments. If you want to read the report, Natural Capital, What Farmers and Policymakers Need to Know, it is in the chat. Take a, a, a copy and paste before we end the, uh, the session or go to the Food, Farming and Countryside Commission website, ffcc.co.uk, click latest and then news. Uh, please also check out the 8.9 hectares website, 8.9.com or search for us at 8.9 HA on Google. Our next webinar, as I said, is on Friday and the chat will hopefully be working. It's an alternative food summit discussing what was on offer at the number 10 food summit yesterday and then perhaps more importantly, what should have been on the table. That's at 12.30 on Friday and we have an enormous panel brimful with seven fantastic guests. I hope you can join us then. I've been Finlow Castain. Bye for now. <laughs>